Coming up, SpaceX returns to flight. A drill on Mars is broken. I have a live interview with Fraser Kane of Universe Today. And after a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, we bring you Orbit 10 of tomorrow, starting right now. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? Welcome to Orbit 10 on tomorrow. I am Carrie Ann. With me is Jared and Space Mike. I actually have a Dada behind me. Dada! There he is, blending into the blue, which is amazing. Uh, and <laughs> before we get started, though, I want to make sure that we give a huge thank you to our patrons of the Escape Velocity variety. These are the people who have given us $10 or more for this particular segment of this particular episode. And they have, of course, access to our Slack channel, which is really amazing because they get to see all the different changes and all of the cool things that are happening on our brand new Orbit 10 pretty much in real time as they're happening. So thank you to every single one of you. You're doing a great job. Hopefully uh, we're making you proud, right? Yes. Exactly. We're here to so. do that. <laughs> Perfect. So uh, we'd like to get started as we always like to do on the Tomorrow Channel uh, with a couple of uh, launches that happened, right? That's right. We, uh, ha we have two launches we wanted to talk about. Uh, the last one of last year and the first launch of this year. Perfect. So uh, both of these were actually Chinese launches as well. <laughs> Let's get started off with the last launch of 2016, which was a Long March 2D rocket, which launched two SuperView satellites into orbit. Let's check out the footage. I love the insulation falling away. Totally. But yeah, that's uh, kind of all we get from uh, this particular launch this time, and uh, that's unfortunate. But with this whole launch, uh, this was actually launching uh, two SuperView that, uh, satellites that are Earth imaging satellites, and they were initially placed into the wrong orbit. This is a, an image of what the one of the satellites looked like. They're both identical satellites. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was originally going into a sun-synchronous orbit that was planned to go to an altitude of 500 kilometers. But at first, uh, they uh, weren't placed in the, the planned orbit. They, their apogee, or their highest point, was reaching the intended target, but their lowest point did not. However, the onboard uh, fuel on board the spacecraft was able to uh, push the spacecraft into uh, close enough to their intended orbit at 500 kilometers, or for those of you in the United States, about 325 miles. So congratulations to China for that, even though they didn't really acknowledge that it had a, a little bit of an anomaly not getting those satellites into the intended orbit at first anyway. I mean, that sounds like China, right? Yeah. <laughs> Still a success right. all the way. <laughs> all right. And what else has China done? You said another one, yeah? Yeah. They kicked off the first launch of the year, and this was a Long March 3B rocket, which launched a kind of secretive uh, test communication satellite. Let's mm -hmm. check out some footage from this. Now this launched at 1518 Coordinated Universal Time from the Zhicheng Space Center on Thursday, January 5th, uh, 2017. And as I said, it was the, uh, a test communications satellite, and it's actually the second one in this series that they've uh, uh, launched into orbit. However, there's no additional information as to what this satellite is. We don't even really know what it looks like. Um, but hopefully they're able to uh, successfully test that and uh, you know, be able to get a good orbit from that. But in any case, China is the first uh, successful orbital space launch of this year. So congratulations to China and everyone who, were, who was involved with all of those launches. Nice. Really nice. Uh, it's going to be an exciting year for sure for 2017. Uh, so congratulations, Absolutely. of course, to China on that one. And I know this next story you're really excited about. So <laughs> I won't delay you any longer. 
What's going on, Mike? <laughs> well, one of the big things we're looking forward to this year is <laughs> SpaceX's return to flight. And the FAA just gave them a launch license. They gave them clearance to be able to launch their Falcon 9 again. Does that look like now, a driver's license or like, like a passport? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Go on. Long form. Sorry. It's a really long PDF with like really, really <laughs> tiny legalese print. It's, it's kind of hard to read, but okay. it, it does have a really cool stamp on the top of it. So that's cool. Nice. I should have grabbed an image of that. <laughs> <laughs> yes! <laughs> next time, next time, for there you sure. Go. <laughs> but with this whole return to flight thing, if uh, for those of you watching who don't know, uh, SpaceX suffered an uh, uh, anomaly on September 1st where they lost a, a Falcon 9 rocket and the payload Amos 6. And since then, they have completed the investigation into that anomaly. And although they still don't know the exact cause of why the uh, anomaly occurred, they have a pretty good leading cause as to why it, it, it could have happened. And the leading theory uh, th is that one of the uh, helium tanks, this is the inside of the, the Falcon 9 upper stage, and you can see those three kind of black canisters along the wall. Those are the helium tanks that are made out of composite uh, overwrap of pressure vessels, or COPVs. And one of those, they believe, buckled a little bit, and there's a lining between uh, the aluminum and the, the composite overwrap that uh, holds the tank together. And they believe that when it buckled in slightly, some of the super chilled uh, liquid oxygen uh, kind of seeped in between those layers and being a super cold densified propellant froze even more because the helium was also at a very cold temperature and it became solid oxygen. Yeah. And when that buckle occurred or even with the, the, it freezing into solid oxygen, they believe that there was friction that occurred that it caused the initial spark that just <laughs> set the whole thing on fire. I mean, they only had 0.93 milliseconds of data before the entire thing was up in flames. So. Uh, that's a that's a pretty uh, um, it's a pretty good theory. But in any case, uh, the FAA was able to go over the information for that, and SpaceX also also successfully conducted a static fire test on Thursday of this week. And uh, we have some uh, you know just a stock footage of the first uh, test that they did with their uh, static fire test. And with this, they've had to change a little bit of their procedures that they've been doing for uh, the Falcon 9 rocket. And with this, uh, they have said that they are going to be uh, changing the configuration of those helium tanks, and they will allow warmer temperatures of, of the helium to be loaded. As well, they will be uh, returning the helium loading operations to a uh, prior flight-proven configuration that they've done before. So hopefully with those changes, they won't have any more accidents like this occur. And it's enough that the FAA, like I said, was able to give them clearance, and they will be launching hopefully sometime next week. No sooner than Monday, but that's the first launch window and launch attempt that they're going to do. So, ah, sorry for ranting about this, but I'm really excited. <laughs> I really hope that SpaceX is able to complete this return to flight and get back to business. Very yeah. nice. Is there control on this hologram data on to like turn down just like the just the energy <laughs> just ever so slightly? I feel like you, the hologram is kind of showing up the real people. A little I, bit. I, got, I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> New technology. I'm so sorry. I don't I don't know what to do. Kids these it, days. It's, it's a 45 minute boot process. <laughs> oh, dang. That's that's true. I, I keep forgetting. Brand new ship, you know, it's, it's, I haven't read all the manuals yet. Um, <laughs> Jared, uh, tell me what's going on on Mars. Yeah, so we've got a little bit of a problem with the Mars rover uh, Curiosity and its drill. Um, now, several weeks ago, um, engineers noticed there were some problems with the percussive drill that it uses to target samples on the surface of Mars. And basically, what this drill is designed to do is it pulverizes the material into powder so then that powder can be transferred to the onboard sampling systems of Curiosity. Now they think that the problem is actually with a brake that's built in to the drill itself. And this brake is what allows the extension of the drill from its little mount okay. so that it can reach out to the actual surface of Mars and then do the, the percussive drilling okay. um, that it does. So what they're doing right now is they're basically, with the motor on the end of its arm, they're literally going back and forth with it right now, shaking it, just trying to see if there's any debris inside of the drill that will eventually fall out or move out of the way of the brake. Um, and engineers at JPL believe that, they're, that because that debris is in there, that shaking it is the best option. Um, so a little shake and bake 
on Mars. Is that like double checking um, to see if there's any Pringles left in the can? Yeah, exactly. That that's, kind of actually, that technique may have been what uh, how it was figured out. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, potentially <laughs> with that there. Um, now they're going to continue to work with this and see if there's a solution that they can come up with. Mm -hmm. um, but if this is a problem with the design, they're going to have to look at the drill on the Mars 2020 rover, which is coming up um, in 2020. Uh, and <laughs> see if they're. And that was a to... clone of Curiosity, right? Yes, it is a clone of Curiosity. It's going to be using the same frame and subset of certain instruments um, like what's on the end of the arm um, but a different set of instruments on board it's more going to be astrobiological um, in, instead of mm. geological um, so instead of studying the rocks and the habitability it's going to look for actual signatures of whether there could potentially have been life or could potentially be life on Mars right now at the surface uh, for all we know and also take samples um, so that they can be cached and maybe uh, gotten and, you know, maybe send another rover to pull those samples out and do a sample return mission sometime in the future. Nice. So they've got to look at the design to make sure that if there is a flaw, that they don't carry that flaw over to the 2020 rover. Sure. Um, but they're not sure yet. They're still working the problem. Um, and, you know, working the problem 100 million miles away on another planet, well, that's just what JPL's excellent at. So pretty sure they'll figure <laughs> out what the problem is and, and resolve that pretty quickly. Nice. Really nice. Mm -hmm. All right, and Mike, uh, we got some missions coming up from NASA. What's going on here? Yeah, so, I mean, I guess kind of speaking of JPL and planetary science, mm -hmm. um, NASA has announced two new Discovery class missions, which are part of the, pl the planetary science programs. Mm -hmm. And both of these missions are going to be visiting asteroids. The first mission is called Lucy, and uh, they uh, what their plan with Lucy is to go visit the Trojan asteroids of Jupiter. These asteroids uh, are in the same orbit as Jupiter, above, or, or rather, in front of and behind the orbit of Jupiter in its Lagrange points. And... Uh, First, it's going to be launched in 2021, and it'll visit a main asteroid belt in 2025 before reaching its final destination, the, the, the Trojan asteroids. And it's going to be visiting those between 2027 to 2033. So a ways away, but something yeah. that I like about both of these missions <laughs> is that they have a cost cap, or rather maximum, of $450 million. Whether or not they actually you know, reach that maximum is, a, is another story. They haven't said how much their projected cost is. But I like that there's a maximum. There's a cap to it so yeah. that... You know, these missions don't go overrun. But the other mission that uh, they're going to be doing is called Psyche. And this is going to be visiting a uh, small, uh, not small, it's rather actually a rather large asteroid in the asteroid belt by the same name, Psyche. And this is a metal asteroid that scientists believe is possibly a remnant of, of a, a core that a, a planet that was forming in our solar system that came apart or was uh, bombarded heavily. I mean, there's some pretty crazy features on this asteroid that we know of already. And uh, with uh, this, this mission, which is uh, going to be led by uh, the Arizona State University, it's going to launch in 2023 and make uh, some flybys of Earth and Mars in 2024 and 2024. Five mm -hmm. before arriving at Psyche in 2030. And uh, we can hopefully find out uh, a little bit more about it and find out whether or not it is the remnant of a core of a protoplanet or exactly what it is and uh, hopefully how we can uh, take advantage of it and make the best use out of it. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, this is kind of a weird question. I don't know if you can answer. Uh, so this is an asteroid that is known. I mean, we have a name for it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's, there are companies out there like Planetary Resources that are trying mm -hmm. to go out and mine asteroids. Is this like one of those, like, is there like a space law situation going on where like NASA's like, no, it's cool, dibs, like I'm going to this asteroid and Planetary <laughs> Resources like, uh, that's cool and all, except that we were so planning on doing that like three years before <laughs> you. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. is there any sort of... I mean, I guess there's there's well, so many asteroids out there, it's not that big of a deal. But I feel like if this one has already been identified as being, you know, an iron core, well, me metal possible core, you know what I'm saying? I'm not, yeah, I'm not finishing any of my sentences, is, uh, I apologize. Most of our <laughs> no, but the, that's, a, that's a whole other can of worms because there's a whole uh, set of different uh, legal or rather new laws that are trying to be passed, not only here in the United States, but planetary resources have been working with Belgium and Switzerland or mm -hmm. rather Luxembourg to get uh, laws passed so that they would have property rights to whatever asteroids they go and start to mine. Right. I guess the whole kind of theory that uh, people are trying to push forward is that if you can get to it, 
then it's yours. <laughs> Essentially, yeah. but it's, it's, it's a lot more. It's a lot more complicated than that, and varies by country from country. So we could do, we could devote a whole show to talking about that, and yeah. uh, maybe we should uh, get uh, maybe one of our friends like Andrew Rush back on the show to uh, explain the legalese a little bit better to all of us. So. Yeah, right. I'm really excited about these missions because um, Trojan asteroids are kind of the leftovers of the solar system's formation. Mm. So that's that's very critical to understanding whether these models that we make of the solar system are correct. And then going to Psyche, which um, you know could be the core of a planet, actually is one of those missions where if we learn about that and we find out that it is the core of a of an ancient planet that basically had its crust and mantle blown off during um, the period of bombardment, mm -hmm. um, that will help us gain a huge amount of insight um, in terms of geophysics here on Earth because we, we have a good understanding of what's below our feet, but it's not the best understanding that we right. could possibly have because it's very difficult to get down there, um, as you can imagine, um, to even think about it. So we have to use things like seismic energy and, uh, and, and earthquakes and other things like that to do the job for us um, when they send out their waves and the speed of the waves is influenced by the density of the material and other things like that. So to be able to look at an actual core left over that would be, un that just blows my mind that they could potentially be doing that. Also, they found water <laughs> ice on Psyche as well. So huh. um, that's really exciting, the idea that there is this Bird. metal object out there. And you can also have water ice on a metal object. It's not necessarily something that has to be a comet in order for you to have water ice that's on That's crazy. It, so. And just for some small clarification, at least for me, uh, the Trojan asteroids, that's like a classification, is that Yes, it's a classification mm -hmm. of asteroids um, based upon their position. They are in one of the, uh, if I remember correctly, Lagrange points, uh, which mm -hmm. balances the gravity between Jupiter and the sun. Gotcha. So they are basically orbiting in front of Jupiter mm -hmm. as they go around the sun and around that area. Interesting. So interesting. Even something that's interesting is that even the Earth has a, a few, nowhere, nowhere close as much as Jupiter, but it has yes. a few Trojan asteroids of its own in our orbit around the sun. So uh, there, there's lots of different ideas of going and visiting one of those someday. And uh, yeah, a lot of the, there's, it's just one of those really cool phenomenons with uh, the gravitational dead zone of Lagrange points. And uh, I'm really excited to see it yeah and Don't really quickly the data for from it. people who aren't familiar with the term lagrange points that's that sort of neutral gravity kind of areas right like there's the belts where like they're not being pulled over here and they're not being pulled over there they're kind of just in this weird sort of uh -huh. Purgatory. Yeah. It's like a, it's an area where you can drop something and, gra and the gravity will balance it out and keep it in generally the same area. Cool. So Very cool. Uh, and then uh, 17, Dr. 1701 in the chat room is asking, uh, would you not expect water ice on a metal object for some reason that's weird? Um, yeah, it is weird um, because we're, when we talk about asteroids and comets, we're we typically think about them in their sort of classic, classical classification that they come with where asteroids are more stony, iron, metallic, and comets are more um, icy, Water dusty ice. <laughs> bodies. Yeah, okay. Vo what we would call volatiles, which is sure. another, which is the scientific way of saying ice. Um, so, uh, so to find volatiles on a metal asteroid would be very, very weird because then whoa, this kind of changes our ideas in classification. And Psyche is not the only object um, that has done this in recent memory. Um, there's been a couple Hubble observations of asteroids that have tails like comets. Mm -hmm. And also comets that ha that appear to have metallicity or the same type of metal content that you would find in asteroids. So it's in the past five years, the lines have started to become very, very blurred. So it's still considered weird because it's not the majority of the objects. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, um, to find water on a metallic object would be very, very bizarre. And, uh, and we would want to see if there's any sort of interaction between the metallic object and the water that may be on it. Interesting. So. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, we, we've got a couple other stories going on, but I think we only have time for like one more. Uh -huh. um, and I don't mean to skip you, Jared, but Mike, can you tell us about what's going on with the battery swap on the International Space Station? 
Oh, sure, absolutely. So, um, on the International Space Station, there's the four large solar array panels, and with those, there is a set of 12 batteries inside each one of those uh, that are a nickel hydrogen battery. Uh -huh. And what you're seeing on screen right now is an EVA that was conducted yesterday, on Friday, by American astronauts Shane Kimbrough and Peggy Whitston. Uh, go Peggy. They completed a six. Uh, yeah, go Peggy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they completed a six-hour uh, extravehicular activity yesterday to replace start replacing those nickel hydrogen batteries with newer, smaller lithium ion batteries. Um, and with this, they're only, um, what they're doing is they're working on six at a time. They're taking out six of the old uh, nickel hydrogen batteries and replacing them with three of the, the lithium ion batteries. There's 48 of the old batteries total, and they're going to be replaced with uh, 24 of the newer lithium ion batteries. Now, the six that they currently um, are replacing are going to be, two of them are going to be left at the station and, and uh, the rest of them are going to be loaded onto uh, the HTV capsule, the, Jap the Japanese HTV cargo freighter, which delivered these new lithium ion batteries to the station uh, last month in December. Um, and with this, uh, they're only doing a couple at a time. So they took out six of the, of the nickel hydrogen batteries and they were able to successfully install three of the new lithium ion batteries yesterday. Oh. They're going to be conducting another spacewalk next week and this one's going to have Shane Kimbra and then the uh, European Space Agency astronaut um, uh, Thomas uh, Pescat, I think I said I said that wrong, but uh, um, he's going to be doing the EVA with uh, Shane Kimbrough to uh, swap out the next series. And they're just doing one of the uh, the, um, the the power packs on on each of the solar arrays at a time. And of course, all of this is for so that they can have uh, power during night passes uh, in their orbit around Earth. So very cool. Um, very cool, very cool that they were able to do this. And they're going to, like I said, they're going to keep some of them at the space station to kind of study how they decay mm -hmm. so that we can get a little bit more information about that because there's lots of other spacecraft, operational spacecraft right now that use the same type of batteries even if they're not the same size, these nickel hydrogen batteries. So definitely want to find out more about how it decays and when they start to, to go faulty and everything like that. The rest of them are just going to be loaded back into the uh, HTV ca uh, cargo freighter and uh, be uh, burned up in the atmosphere during its destructive reentry. And I believe that's going to be happening at the end of this month at the end of uh, January oh, awesome. and uh, yep. then, th then they're going to have three more uh, cargo flights of the Japanese uh, HTV freighters to deliver the rest of the batteries for the swap out. So it's going to take a while to, to finish this process. It's going to take a couple of years, especially since they're kind of averaging one HTV flight a year. So, right, right, right. Uh, But in any case, the, the process has started and uh, we have one of the successful EVAs down. So nice. hopefully everything goes well next week and they're able to finish this uh, replacement process quickly. And the chat room was mentioning uh, it looked like they were moving really fast. Uh, the video was sped up just yeah, I'm sorry. a little bit. No, that no, no, was no, you're fine. The video was like seven <laughs> hours long, so I just kind of picked some of my favorite spots and yeah. sped them up to four times uh, uh, normal speed. So I apologize if that was... No, uh, it was really important uh, work. They just were working really fast. It's totally yeah. fine. You got to move fast when you're outside, you know? Yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> Actually, right. no. You got to move really slow. Really slow. Yes, you need to you very make carefully. Sure. And not drop anything and let anything fly away. I love it. I love it. All right. So, great. So we're that only was... an hour show. So. Okay, exactly. <laughs> um, okay. So, we're going to take a little bit of a break. Jared and I and Mike are going to get a chance to sit down for a half second while Ben conducts an interview with Fraser Kane from Universe Today. So, stay with us. We'll be right back. And welcome back to tomorrow. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham coming to you live from the observation deck of station 204. Now before we get started with our interview, I wanted to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are our Escape Velocity members. These are people who have contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. We've also got our Patreon Orbit members. These are people who have contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. To find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash 
T-M-R-O. All right, uh, brand new space station and brand new guests. We're bringing Fraser Kane on from Universe Today to talk a little bit about, about astronomy, because uh, I think that's one of the areas that we're actually very, very weak in. We talk a lot about rocket hardware and how, what it takes to get to space. But I realized not that long ago, we're all about going to Mars, but when I go outside at night, I can't tell you where Mars is in the night sky. So let me ask you this, why is astronomy important? Why why is astronomy important? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, let's that's start like let's asking like oh, sure like why is anything important? Why is knowledge important? But but no, I, you know, astronomy is is our way of contemplating our existence in the universe. It's a way of sort of giving everything perspective. We realize that we are just on this insignificant speck in this gigantic universe that goes on for billions of of light years, maybe infinity. And uh, so if you want to feel small, that is that is the way to do it. Uh, you know, and obviously there are tons of more practical purposes. A lot of the space flight that you guys are all talking about is really based on astronomy, right? All of the the ways of navigating around the solar system, all of the tools used for determining the ages of things, the distance to things, that's all astronomy. And it's going to come in really handy when they make those, those uh, spacecraft capable of going to other stars. So... That's why we have astronomy. And wh what got you started in astronomy? Well, I've been, uh, you know, an excited amateur astronomer since I was a kid, really. And I think I bought my first telescope when I was like 13 years old, and uh, and then hilariously sort of went into a into s software development as a career, and then came back around to getting into astronomy and science journalism uh, sort of in my mid-20s and have sucked to it ever since. So I've always been super interested in, in astronomy and space exploration. Really, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to choose between my two favorite topics. You know, uh, working, working in space and astronomy is expensive and a huge time suck. Uh, so why do you keep at it? Why, why, uh, why go, yes, this is a thing that I want to do in my spare time? Because you don't, you don't do Universe Today full time, do you? Yeah, I do. Oh, okay. So, but you didn't always yeah. do Universe Today full time. I'd say for fifteen years I have been. Okay, so, uh, uh, well, then let me back that way up. I thought you came back from a. Uh, let's talk about your history then. No, uh, I've been I've been the publisher of Universe Today for seventeen years and have essentially just been doing both, doing space exploration news and astronomy news, sort of hand in hand, and then I think. You know, the last 10 years I've been doing the Astronomy Cast podcast with Dr. Pamela Gay. So that's where, you know, a lot of people see it from the astronomy side. But like when I do the guide to space, I sort of balance them. You know, why, you know, how is space trying to kill you? How, you know, how do rockets work? Uh, you know, what are all the ways we've explored Mars? And then I'll talk about more astronomy, cosmology type topics like, you know, where's the center of the universe? And, you know, does the universe go on forever and things like that. So I, you know, I've been, no, 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 my whole job is is reporting on space and astronomy and have been for, you know, there's like maybe two years when I had an old job and then I was doing this, I was moonlighting this and then it just became my full-time job. And what are some of your favorite astronomy stories that you've done? Like some of those things where you're like, oh my God, even I can't believe this. Wow. You just blew my mind. Yeah, uh, yeah, that kind. Of, yeah, that reaction yeah, yeah, yeah. where you're like, "Oh my!" Yeah, I'm, yeah, pfft. yeah. Well, so there, I've been doing this long enough now that I have gone through this full cycle. So, so you know, you know, we who are fans of astronomy and and space, uh, we have these mysterious questions, you know, like what does Ceres look like? What does Vesta look like? What what do the moons of Saturn look like? And we literally, you know, what does Pluto look like? We had no idea what Pluto looked like up close until 20, what, 15, right? July. So we're, we've only known for like a year and a half what, what Pluto looks like up close. So my, you know, we all grew up with all these known facts. We know how the sun works and we know how, uh, you know, what a black hole is and a pulsar is and these kinds of things. But there's a whole class of things right now that we are watching people figure these out in real time. We're looking at things like gravitational waves and dark matter and dark energy. Dark energy was really only just discovered in 1998. You know, the most, the largest of volume, you know, the largest component of the entire universe was only figured out only identified and discovered 
what, just less than 20 years ago, and we don't even know what it is. So I think my favorite part about this is just watching these, these stories unfold in real time and being, you know, having done this job for so long now, I kind of have perspective. And so people are so, uh, you know, they really want these things to get resolved. Like I don't, I don't believe in dark matter because it hasn't been figured out yet. And yet here we are watching it bit by bit, piece by piece, get figured out in in real time and that's the part that I just I just find so fascinating. So there's tons of these stories, you know, what quasars are, what dark energy is, what dark matter is, accretion disk, how planets form, uh, you know, what are some of the surface features? Is there life on Mars? You know, what is this methane in the atmosphere on Mars? Uh, what did Pluto look like? How did it, how has it got mountains made of ice? So there's just so much stuff. I, I don't even know where to start. Like that's the great part about it. And then how do you get people excited about these things, right? Because it's really easy for everyone to kind of look down and be like, oh, we have so many problems on Earth. But as many Stoges asking, do you target people who are already space fans or you try to engage the general public? You know, how, how do you pull people in? Well, you're just following my enthusiasm, I hope. So I, you know, I mean, I can't be any other way than I am. And I get super, super excited about this kind of stuff. And I just go off on a on an epic rant. I really, really enjoy what's going on out there. I follow my, you know, I'm like, this is cool. I really think this is really interesting to you. And then I turn around and I and I show people what I think I've found and what I think is interesting. And I think that seems to engage and people enjoy it. So I think that's, you know, that's, I'm always making the stuff that I make, the stories I write, the podcasts that I do. I'm just kind of trying to Almost like if I didn't know these things, I would want – these are the things that I would want to know. And then – and it appears that other people sort of appreciate coming along for the ride. And that's just all I can follow is my own enthusiasm. And it seems to – you know, seems, seems to be catchy. And, and as a Citizen Big Number asks, uh, do you think that's the best strategy for spreading awareness? Like getting other people uh, – I think we're, we're all kind of in the – or at least at, at tomorrow, we kind of have this all ship rides with the tide, right? So if we can get more people excited about – space exploration and, and going out there and learning things, uh, then we'll be able to do more space exploration going out there and learning things. And is it just being, is that the key, being enthusiastic? Well, I think enthusiasm is, is important. If you see somebody into something, then that's something that you're going to be into too. But I mean, you look at our popular culture, look at all the top movies, look at all the top video games. They're all space-based, right? Uh, that you know, that, that there is in the popular culture this appreciation and excitement for the future, for humans' exploration of space, for the kinds of really interesting stuff that's out there. So I think that enthusiasm already exists. I think that, that popular culture has already identified it, and I think that other people are sort of catching up to that enthusiasm that is already there and finally treating it with a certain amount of respect. You know, you go see Rogue One, that is, that's got spaceships, it's got... It's got, you know, uh, engines that can get you faster than the speed of light. You've got artificial gravity. You've got megastructures. You've got, you know, galactic empires. You've got all these concepts which are space exploration, space astronomy related. And why are these movies so popular? If you look at all of the top movies ever, a lot of them have to do with space. You know, Avatar, uh, tons of them. So I think that I think that enthusiasm is already there. It just there isn't sort of a, a larger funnel that takes people's initial enthusiasm and then shows them that this stuff is actually as interesting and as exciting as the space movie or the space video game has has led you to believe. And I think that's just the gap. And that's where I like to live, which is to say. You remember that Death Star? Let's figure out how that Death Star would actually work if it was going to try and destroy a planet. What are the kinds of science that's being discovered that would make it feasible or infeasible? Does that mean that you're the evil villain if you're trying to build the Death Star? How, where does that... Because I've always wanted to be the evil villain, so are, are you the villain or the hero then? Well, it's a, I guess it's a race. Whichever one of us can build the Death Star <laughs> first. first. I think... I think neither of us will. So, <laughs> um, uh, uh, Jazz Throat asks, you know, so, some of these uh, topics are fairly complicated. You know, the astronomy gets pretty heady. It's it's pretty deep in math uh, from time to time. How long does it take you to research some of these topics? 
Well, I mean, keep in mind once again, I'm you know I'm I'm a journalist, not an astronomer. So my you know my background is in computer science. I think I have a I have a failed year of engineering. So my physics um, I have one year of engineering under my belt. So my my physics understanding is sort of mid university level, and so I rely on a lot of people. You know, when we do our weekly space hangout, all of our uh, regular panelists pretty much are PhD astrophysicists, cosmologists. Uh, or or working in that direction, so I I lean pretty heavily on the people around me who who know the science better, uh, and I think there's sort of there's the two levels to it, right? And I'm sure it's the same with with the space exploration people. There's the people who want who want to know that the rocket launched and it's arriving and it's going to have to aero break and it's going to have to land and there's some problems with that that it's complicated and difficult to land on the surface of Mars. And there's people who want to know the thrust and the velocity and the delta v and they want to know the specifics. Of you know what kind of materials are being used, so I typically stay in the first area where I where I I keep it a little less specific, but I also really try to appreciate the raw intelligence of the people that I'm explaining this stuff to. The other thing as well is is that you know there's a story that's getting built over time that you're explaining these topics, and as people come along for the ride, you can start to gloss over the stuff that we all know about that quasars are actually actively feeding supermassive black holes and get to the new stuff or get to the interesting stuff. And, I, and I'm sure you do the same as well, which is that you, know, you put everything into context for people and over time you can spend a lot more time sort of in you know, building on the newer knowledge. So that's the way I approach it. Yeah, I'll, I'll say for us it's, it's a little bit, it's a, it's a constant balancing act, right? Because you always have new people and you're always trying to engage new people. And you know, maybe those people who were really interested in space as, as a kid and then kind of almost grew out of it, right? It, it wasn't cool maybe in high school anymore. At least that's what happened to me, right? Uh, and then you want to rekindle that passion, but they're coming from essentially a blank slate. Uh, so for us, we have like no acronym policies and always, you know, we don't want to assume you're stupid because you're not, you know, the, the general audience of tomorrow knows what's going on, even if you're new, but then trying to balance that with the people who are really deep into this stuff, right? Really are into the weeds of it and know all of it. Uh, you know, for us, that's fairly complicated. Is it the same deal with you or you just kind of go, you know what, this is what feels right. This is what we're going to do. Yeah, well, I mean, that's always the balance, right? And you just have to use your instincts on that. But I think a lot of the feedback that we get with, with say, Astronomy Cast is, is that we do get that balance right, that we are... Uh, you know, and that's sort of my job of the show. Pamela is the PhD astrophysicist. I am the layman everyman, uh, and I am asking the questions. And if something is sort of over my head, I'm trying to get her to break it down further, but not too far, not to the point that that it really does feel like it's getting dumbed down. And my hope is is that when a person, uh, we just did the interview with the astronaut Abby uh, yesterday on the Weekly Space Hangout, and it was great. And she said, "Wow, you asked me a bunch of questions that nobody's ever asked me before," because I do know enough of this information to get past all of the, you know, the the stuff at the top and go to the deeper stuff that I think is is interesting to the audience and interesting to me. So you know, we always have that balance, and I think what's important is that you, you know, and I'm that I'm so excited and enthusiastic about what we're doing. I am playing video games about it. I am listening to podcasts. I'm watching science fiction. I'm reading books. I'm writing stories, I'm creating videos, I'm just immersed in it all the time and I think about it all the time. It sounds like I'm a crazy person. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like you're just, you're just immersed in it and you can sort of be the guide and be the, the person who looks at all the stuff that's out there and goes, hey everybody, this is interesting this week and then have something different that's interesting next week. You said you're playing video games about it. What are some of your favorite video games that you're playing? Well, I love Kerbal Space Program. Oh, of course. I, I, the, the quote I always say is that I learned more about the orbital mechanics of playing Kerbal Space Program in about eight hours than I had in, in 15 years of, of, <laughs> ex, of reporting on space exploration. That, that suddenly pieces of the puzzle all dropped into my brain, which was great. Uh, I've been playing uh, No Man's Sky, but I'm not a huge fan of it. Um, I've been playing uh, uh, Stellari. Stellaris, yeah, which is great. I really enjoy the uh, the Paradox games. I play a ton of Europa Universalis, which is probably, but it's not very space-based. 
You, you mentioned uh, Kerbal Space Program. It reminds me of the XKCD uh, comic where, you know, talking about how, yeah. you know, how much you know about orbital mechanics. You know, your, your high school, college, hired at NASA, goes up a little bit, started playing KSP just straight off the top of the graph. Um, uh, so, Games, you also mentioned, uh, like, movies and books. What are your, some of your favorite? Like, do you watch Interstellar? Do you get angry mm -hmm. at some t some of the things? You're like, oh, <laughs> no! Yeah, little, or do well, you... yeah, but I, don't you? I mean, oh, man, yeah. I, mean, you I, watch... I think I, I'm okay with suspending disbelief to a point, right? I mean, I guess mm -hmm. it depends. Like, you watch The Martian, for example. I think they did a... Um, and maybe this is this maybe this is bad to say, but I think they did an okay enough job with the science that it was acceptable. But then there are other movies like The Core where it, they did not do an okay enough yeah. job with the science, and it's not acceptable. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's like sometimes it's so bad it's good, right? We did a we did a let's watch of Armageddon, where. Um, <laughs> Uh, a uh, PhD uh, astrophysicist and I, uh, Nicole Galucci, actually she's a radio astronomer, and we watched Armageddon live with our fans and, uh, and then just did a sort of, uh, you know, like riff tracks. And it was just, it was so painful and so many, you know, it's an asteroid the size of Texas. Well, there's, there's, there's only one, right, series. That's, that is the asteroid the size of Texas. We know where it is. It's not coming anywhere near us. So, uh, you know, that is the... Uh, I, I like you, I give, you know, science fiction, I give it a, a number of, of gimmies, right? So, and then there's a couple where you do have to sort of say, well, you know, like, I guess what I feel is like when it's lazy, when they could have made it scientifically accurate, but they just didn't bother because they were feeling lazy or they didn't, that they could have written it so that it was scientifically accurate. They could have, it was, it was exactly as much work the way they showed it to one that's scientifically accurate, that's where I get a little, I don't know, a little frustrated. I mean, you just like when, when robots are catching people who've fallen off of a building and they don't go splat in the hand the way the laws of physics say they should, and instead they could have the robot, you know, decelerate the person as they catch them, that would, it's, it's the same animation. You just show the... You know, show the scientifically accurate version with your big giant transforming robot. <laughs> All right, so uh, what's your favorite movie though? Like favorite space movie, like right now at least. Right now, well, it's got to be The Martian, I would say, mm. is my favorite, you know, but that was like my favorite space book mm. recently as well. I mean, the, the book was just phenomenal and, and everyone I've given the book to just can't put it down. They read it, they pick it up, they finish it, and then they're like, wow, that was awesome. And the movie was the best possible implementation that I think we all could have asked for of the, you know, of the book. So I, I think that was, and that was, that made me very hopeful for what the the future holds in terms of of just being able to, to, to show that you can be scientifically accurate at the same time as telling an amazing story. And if anything, the scientific accuracy adds to the drama, adds to the level of conflict and makes it a, a more exciting story. So I think, I hope that, you know, we're entering this phase where popular culture, I think with all the Marvel movies, are taking fandom seriously. They're saying, oh, okay, you love this thing and we're not just gonna give you garbage because we know you're gonna pay for it because you people are stupid. We are gonna take this thing that you love, like Doctor Strange or the you know, Wolverine or whatever, Deadpool, and and take it very seriously and give you an experience that you as a fan are really gonna appreciate. And you know, the next frontier is to do this with with science. And I think that's starting to happen now. And I think it's great for our overall culture that if people who make these kinds of movies, science fiction, video games, can create entertainment that is also scientifically accurate and show that this stuff is super interesting. So I think I'm, I'm super pumped at this corner that we've turned and I'm really looking forward to what comes next. Uh, all right, so just in general, we'll, we'll, we'll end on this question before we get into our uh, little general questions. Uh, what are you pumped about most? There we go. There we go. Yep. Uh, I'm sorry. What are you pumped about most in 2017? Pumped about most? We, we actually just had this conversation uh, about uh, in the weekly space hangout yesterday, and 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 you guys, I'm sure know, it's not a super crazy year for space exploration because we're in this in between time between the you know outside of the the Mars launch windows. There's not a lot of big stuff happening. There's the tests. 
spacecraft, which is going to give us a ton of new exoplanet discoveries. That's going to launch this year. But from a sort of a visual observing side, the big, big event is going to be the the total solar eclipse that's going to be crossing the United States on August 21st, 2017. So it's going to go from, from Oregon to Nashville. And if you are in the United States or can get to the United States, you should absolutely make your plans to go and see this. Find a spot that you want to go to, make a road trip, get a hotel. There's a lot of people that after they see a total solar eclipse, they just they get hooked and they want to chase them around the world. So this is going to be one of the most accessible eclipses to the vast majority of Americans that's ever been out there. And I think if anything is going to boost people's interest in science, it's going to be this this eclipse. So this is the thing that I am, you know, it's the thing I am most excited about almost of the decade, and we're only a few months away now. So, uh, and, and actually one last question. Um, for, for me, something like that was similar. Um, I kind of cared about astronomy. I was like, oh yeah, I mean, th this matters. Um, but I, again, I was more about the, the rockets, the spaceships, the hardware, um, you know, the, the engineering behind all of it. Uh, and then I got a tour of Griffith Observatory from Jared, and it was, it, it blew my mind. I mean, it just, I, it was absolutely incredible and reawakened something in me that was just, just mind-blowingly awesome. Uh, is this one of those moments for people that maybe this can, you know, awaken something special in them? Or, or is there a different moment where you're like, you need to do this, it will change your life? Yeah. I have a super easy thing that people can do, which is to look at Saturn through a telescope. Mm. So it's any small telescope can show Saturn. And when you do that and you realize, you look up in the sky and there's that dot and that's Saturn. And then you look in the telescope and, and there you can see the rings. And if the telescope's good enough, you can see the Cassini division. It is, it is this connection to space, to these things that you've seen. You know, you see pictures of Cassini taking shots of the moons, but you don't really realize that that thing is up in space and it's right over there and that you can go outside and see it. Right now, I'm sure people have noticed that Venus, Mars, and uh, the moon are all, they were fairly close in the sky a couple of days ago. Uh, now the moon is kind of pushed a little to the to the east from from them, but uh, Neptune and Uranus are in that same cluster as well. So you can actually take a picture that had the Moon, Uranus, Neptune, Mars, Venus all at the same time. You can do that with you know a pair of binoculars. You can see all of them, and then in the morning you can see Jupiter. So that's but it's that like seeing Saturn. So if anyone in the audience has never seen Saturn through a telescope, uh, that's one of the things that you really got to do. And then the other one is like a big comet. A mm. big comet with the with the unaided eye that you can actually see. That is mind bending, and we haven't had a good comet now for more than twenty years. You know, when is the next but, good comet that would be comet that would? Be we like, don't know. Hmm. We don't know. That's the problem, right? Is we don't know when they come. They they show up. They graze the sun. They fly close to the earth, and they have this huge tail, and we can see it in the sky. And we haven't seen one in a long time. So, so no, this is. Uh, uh, and I, we always make this joke, the universe owes me a comet. We were supposed to get this amazing comet a couple of years ago, and it just it fizzled out, cracked up, and, and disappeared. And so now the universe owes me. I, I gave the universe a ton of press time. We <laughs> talked about it. I you know, spent so much time going on and on about it, and then it never happened, and I, I need a do-over. Well, and when because the universe owes you, when you call in that chip, it's going to be an amazing comet. It's Better. Going be, it's going to be great. It's going to look yeah, up and exactly. be like, oh my gosh, it's going to be just fantastic. Yeah, there it is. File K okay, universe for square. <laughs> all right. Uh, before we go into break, uh, just a few quick general questions that we ask all of our guests. Uh, the first is uh, moon or Mars first? Moon. Uh, why? Oh, uh, well, because it's close. And that space is hard, and I think that it's better to figure out a lot of the technology on the surface of the moon where it is close, and it's tougher. I mean, the gravity is lower, the uh, the atmosphere is worse, the radiation is harsher, the so all of those things are worse, and so any technology that you can develop on the moon should be fairly applicable to what you do over on Mars where it's easier. The the regolith is more toxic if you get it in your lungs. So it's just it's just a it's a tougher challenge. And at the same time though it's closer. And so if you're like, oh my God, they need a spatula and then you can 
fly them up a spatula and get it to them within a week, right? Space spatula can, needed stats! So exactly. And then you can and you can also rescue them and you can also communicate with them so that you can in real time go, you know, did you turn it off? Did you turn it on again? Try it now. Try it now. You know, why isn't this Skype working? That kind of thing. Uh, would you go? No. Ever? No. I. Well, I, sure, ever, yeah, but uh, but you know, I am not the person who wants to go and and dedicate his life to uh, trying to hew civilization out of the Martian regolith. You know, it's a it's a it's gonna be, whoever goes there has got a really tough job ahead of them. And personally, I love Earth. I love the the oceans and the mountains and the trees. And I've just barely started exploring this planet. Now, if I could go, you know, climb to the top of Olympus Mons and, and jump around for a little while, uh, I would totally do it as a vacation and then come back uh, a year later safely. But but I am not the person who is going to go and and try to push humanity to that next level. I got kids. I, as I said, I like Earth. So you know, you'll is... vacation, but you won't settle. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Right. Same thing the with the moon. Gonna... Same thing with the moon. You would go to the moon. Yeah, you vacation, but you're not going to stay there. Absolutely. Once those colonists have made that place safe, I will come and visit them and cheer them on. And I will cheer them on he from here on Earth. I'm enthusiastically supportive of anybody who wants, who chooses to go and, and live that life. I think uh, you're a better person than me. <laughs> just, you'll wait for the indoor plumbing to work. I'll wait for exactly. <laughs> I, just, I just need a space toilet that's going to work. Space, space, they don't work. They keep breaking down. You'd think no, the space no, toilet that is not is that the hard. hard. See, that is the hardest challenge of all is, is how can we poop in space? <laughs> and until that gets solved, I think all that other stuff just hasn't really been figured out yet. I feel like that's the name of this episode. Hardest challenge of all, how do we poop in space? How do we poop uh, in space? Yeah. When do you think humans will first land on Mars? Well, uh, so we have this term that we call musk time, uh, <laughs> right? And so just you doing the soul whatever, conversion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you take whatever number Elon Musk gives you, and you know he tends to fulfill his commitments. It just takes longer than you think, and you know depending on the complexity of the commitment, you have to extend a certain amount of musk time. So uh, you know he says the Red Dragon is going to go in 2018. Uh, that the first. Colonial transporter filled with 100 people is going to go in 2024. I think that's going to happen. It probably won't have 100 people on it, and it's probably not going to go in 2024. But I think we are within a decade of his estimate of when this thing actually does get off the off the ground and go to Mars. I think he's serious. Like I think he's deadly serious that that this is the future of SpaceX. And when he does things like say, oh, well, to fund it, we're going to put up 3,000 satellites orbiting Earth, providing high-speed gigabit internet to everyone on Earth. Like, yeah, that would pay for it, right? <laughs> so, so I think that, that Musk is, is committed to the cause and is innovative enough to raise the money and see these things through to when they happen. So I do think that it's probably going to be SpaceX. It's probably going to be within a decade of that original estimate that humans are going to be setting foot on on Mars. Uh, I, I don't know when people are going to return to the moon. I hope it's sooner. It's probably going to be the Chinese is sort of my feeling now. They're, they're moving very quickly and very aggressively towards uh, these, you know, towards colonizing the moon and you know what you're seeing with some of their their rovers some of their space stations and some of their their missions pushing out past lunar orbit so that's what i think is that those are my off-the-cuff predictions and the very last question is why space why, why space as opposed to anything well you know i mean i'm sure you get that classic question right it's like why should we explore space when we have all these problems here on earth right and the first thing is that that's a ridiculous question to ask that why take out pizza right that that you know the amount that the americans spend on take out pizza is like i think 50 billion dollars a year so so it makes like stop eating take out pizza and explore space and <laughs> three times over what the NASA's budget is. So I think that that sort of first question is we spend all kinds of money on all kinds of things that other people think are ridiculous and don't you judge. It's the, sort of that first question. But I think the other thing is, is, that, is that we need to explore space to make life on Earth better. I really, you know, a lot of people thought that uh, Jeff Bezos' answer to this question about 
you know, he's not a fan of Mars. He wants to get all that heavy industry off the surface of Earth and out into space to help protect Earth. And I think that's a great idea. You know, you get all of this pollution, all of this garbage, all of this radiation and get it off the planet, get it out into space, send the the completed things back down to Earth, send the energy back down to Earth and keep this planet the best you can. And I think the more we get this stuff off of the planet, the more we can make Earth better. And so, in fact, we may require going to space to make Earth better and to solve the problems that we have here on Earth. And, of course, the other part is that we just, we adventure and we explore. It's what human beings do. And you can't stop us. We're just going to keep going. Uh, so you have a lot of media assets online. Where can people go to, to find you? Well, the best thing to do is just search for Universe Today. We try to be everywhere in all the places. So obviously the website, uh, and then we do the guide to space and all of our shows on uh, on YouTube. We've got a cool Instagram channel where we feature people's astrophotography. And then, of course, the other big thing is Astronomy Cast, which we're, we're on our 10th season now. We've got more than 300 episodes. And so if you want to learn about space and bring yourself up to speed on the astronomy side of it, I think you'll really enjoy that. And uh, I see you've got a Patreon logo in the background as well. Uh, you know, we're funded. We're, do a little uh, Patreon plug if you want. Sure. Well, I mean, I think before I plug my own Patreon, I'm going to plug your Patreon, which <laughs> is that that this is, I mean, Patreon is, in my mind, is this revolution, right? That we until this point, or and you look at traditional media, they were all funded by advertising. And now for the first time, there's an opportunity for we as creators to connect directly with the fans and create the content that you want to see. And so when you look at all of those people who are, who are donating money to the show, and then you're seeing the amazing set that's getting created, that you're able to bring in virtual hologram versions of yourselves and all this cool camera switching gear. I mean, this stuff costs money, and you are are spending the money to make this show better and better and, and bringing in amazing guests, of course. Uh, so I think that that if you are watching this show and you enjoy it and like just like look inside your heart and do you enjoy this show, then it's really, I think, a, an amazing step to to go and join the Patreon campaign. You don't have to join from, you know, I'm, I'm sure you guys, it's like join, start with a dollar, right? Like just you'll yep. see what that level of connection and fanship for the thing that you love means to the people who are creating it. And I can't recommend getting, you know, you already spend money on a movie ticket. You already go and you buy a video game. You already go and and get a, a cable subscription. So if you love watching this show, you should join their Patreon campaign. And of course, mine is at patreon.com slash universe today. And you know, the same goes for you. Uh, I know we're supposed to be going to break, but I, that was a very great, passionate plea. Um, and it truly, it's very true. Did it change for you? Did it change your show as well? I mean, oh, was yeah. it like just a game changer in your world? It, well, it's two things, right? Like one, you have this group of people that are, you can't believe that people love what you're doing enough to donate money. And I think that that's the part that you sort of have this imposter syndrome where you're like, wait a minute, what? You want me to do this more and you want to help me have this be a career? Okay, I I will do this for you. Uh, so I think that's the step that is just, that's amazing. And you as the, you know, it's just a dollar, it's two dollars. Like You don't realize how much of a difference it makes in the minds of of the creators who they're so used to just, not being able to make money from it. So I think that's, it was absolutely a, it's a game changer. It's a, it's, it had blown my mind to be able to do it. And I think that if you're a creator, it is the best way to go forward. In fact, you know, my, I really have one goal, which is I'm going to cut advertising off of everything as soon as we reach a certain point. On we've done, we've actually done that. We, we've killed yeah. as much ads as we can that we're yeah. able to kill. I mean, like they'll yeah. allow us. I mean, if, if, it, the only advertising we have left is stuff that we're not allowed to take off. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's the same thing for me is is I have writers, we have editors, we have people that, you know, do video editing. Like, we have to pay these people's salaries. Sure. And yet every year the amount that we're getting from the patrons grows and eventually we'll be able to shut off the advertising and still pay everybody's salaries. And then we only make stuff for one group, which is the 
the fans. And that is just going to be super exciting. And so, again, if you're, you know, if you're a fan of this show and you have any money, just like a dollar, uh, become a patron. Yeah, and actually, uh, seriously, to that, I'd love to have the community tomorrow help Universe Today get to that goal of, of no advertising and really make it a community-based show. I, I think that's, that's what makes all of this so incredibly awesome is we're a tight-knit community of space geeks who want to see humanity do great and incredible things, and platforms like this help us do that. So like you said, yeah. just a dollar, patreon.com slash universe today. Uh, Fraser, thank you so much for taking time out of your Saturday. Glad to be and, here. And uh, helping us struggle through this particular one. It was a little rougher than normal, <laughs> but you're, you're a very easy guest to have on, so uh, thank you so much. All right. Thanks for having me. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, comments from our last week's, our last year's show. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. And welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get started with comments from our last year's show, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are our escape velocity citizens. These are people who've contributed $10 or more to this episode. We've also got our orbital citizens. These are people who've contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. And then we've of course got suborbital. These are people who've contributed $2.50 or more. And at this level and above, you're going to get access to After Dark, which will be very interesting this week, uh, and a bunch of other fun things. And then we've also got our ground uh, support <laughs> crew as well. These are people who've contributed one dollar or more to this specific episode. To find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow and get your name in the show as a huge giant thank you, head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. You'll notice the names are all different from last year, but the levels are identical. So all we did was tweak the names uh, we went, we had premiere. The, the, we tweak the names of the levels. <laughs> tweak the names of the levels, right? So your the, name in the show still the same. Your name in yes. the show is the same. So uh, uh, <laughs> the, the premiere members are now Escape Velocity. We had uh, producers; those are now Orbital. We had Patreon Plus; that's now Suborbital. And Ground Support are our patrons. So I think that's actually a really clever name. And uh, just m much like a lot of this show, that happened like at what this morning I think that happened this morning that happened like time? two hours before this show we're like let's change everything <laughs> so uh, there you go <laughs> all right um also space mike I'm loving the screen the the type the, the rotation this it's in oh, your interaction you. with it like yeah you looking and then looking at the computer and what's hilarious <laughs> is he actually does have a computer down at that angle so when he's looking down yeah. he actually is looking legitimately at a computer <laughs> Uh, I, think, I think that's all sorts of awesome. All right, let's uh, go ahead. It's and, uh, a little pixelated, though. It's kind of hard to read. <laughs> all right, let's go ahead and get started with uh, some uh, comments from last year's show. Capcom, take us away. So uh, last year's show, the previous show's topic, as it were, was 3D printed habitats, which I didn't think was right, so I went back and double-checked. That is it was, true. It was. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. that's NASA exactly Centennial right. Challenge. Yep. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I, for some reason, that was the part I remembered and not what the actual challenge was. Sorry. Uh, and there, and in case anybody cares, there is a, a NASA challenge about poop. Oh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. About space we're poop. Tying in the we're interview. Better toilets. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So, it's, yeah. Anyhow. Sounds fun. Right. <laughs> Who doesn't like poop? <laughs> so, uh, first comment comes off of YouTube. This one is from Fabio Milan. Ah, uh, long-time commenter. Yes. Uh, about the last episode of the Nat Geo Mars, the one with the delusional botan botanist, botan Botanic scientist? Is that what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Uh, what the hell were they thinking in putting a simple decompression door? No double decompression door for you? Crazy yeah, scientist. Yeah, what were they thinking? Why would you build any sort of... That, that's not a scenario you would ever... I think that's our gripe with that show, mm -hmm. is that they're put into non-real scenarios. Yep. The science was legit, but the scenarios were not legit. You right. would not have a door that just goes straight to the Martian atmosphere. There would be a chamber in between well, to like prevent that exact scenario. Well, even in, the, in one of the other uh, segments of that particular show, I'm pretty sure, uh, they do. They come in from outside and then they have the little 
area where they decompression zone and they have to dust off and all that other stuff. There's not, there's never a time when you would need to open that door and go outside to Mars. Right. No, that's, that's exactly it. Like apparently they only have that on the front door. I I don't know. So we totally agree. Right, right, right. Crew. Uh, Space Mike, Mm -hmm. did you watch, did you watch it as well? Did you watch the Nat Geo I actually uh, have to admit, I haven't been watching a whole lot of them. I think I've only gotten through the first two episodes. So uh, So we spoiled that for you. Just so you know, they're going to open a door that doesn't, that should never exist. Does everyone die? Uh, no, no. I'll but, find uh, out. I'll that's, find out. That's I'll more Rogue out. One-ish. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, there was a spoiler. <laughs> Spo- <laughs> You're welcome, Internet. Oh, please. Like, you knew that going in. Anyhow. All right. Next up. Next up. <laughs> this thing comes from ZapFan. 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 Also Zapfan, off Zapfan. of YouTube. Wait, is it this way? I don't. This, 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 I don't Zapfan. know. Zapfan. It's this Zapfan. way. Just go to the this comment. Way? Seriously. Nope. This way. I'm going to figure out where this that way. button is. I'm going to press it myself. I think SpaceX is a better idea for crew safety and launch abort. In their way that the crew can always escape. If something had gone wrong with the Saturn V or the space shuttle, when the crew were getting in the vehicle... The, they had to get to the bottom of the tower and get into a bunker, get away from an armored vehicle, uh, uh, which would have taken an eternity. Yeah, so yeah, um, okay. why don't we send that over to Space Mike and give us some context as to what they're talking about. <laughs> we all turn. So um, with uh, the Saturn V and like your traditional um, launch abort tower, uh, which the Orion space capsule is going to be using, you can only do that launch abort during certain phases of flight. You know, up. Uh, you know, you can't do it necessarily during max Q. You can do it before and a little while afterwards. And then, you know, once you've jettisoned that and jettisoned your boosters, then you can't do it anymore. Well, but and like, the I'm space shuttle you. itself yeah. didn't Hang necessarily. Hang on, hold on. Pause. Pause. Hold up. Tivo. Pause. Bloop. Uh, wait, uh, hang on. What's the line? It's uh, uh, Mike's seesaw motor functions. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, he doesn't watch Westworld. No, he doesn't. Uh, never mind. Stop making pop culture references. So, Mike, I think they're referencing the uh, fueling that SpaceX wants to do on the pad, which is a little bit different, right? So they wanted to fuel the vehicle. Let's see, how do they want to do this? They want to load the crew onto the vehicle and then, then fuel, fuel it, it, as opposed to what we traditionally do, which is... Fuel the vehicle the and, then, and, then. and then bring the crew on. So I think that's the context of this particular... I was, I was taking it more as the, uh, the pusher escape system, that they could do that at any time and even use those uh, same engines for landing as well. Yeah, but I think it's a specific line. Uh, well, go back to the comment if you can. I know you've already advanced. Uh, but it's the comment, uh, when the crew Zach were getting Zeph, into no? the vehicle, I think is the specific line, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I think in this instance... Uh, why does it matter when it's fueled? Like, when you're getting in the vehicle, why, why does that make any difference? I think that, uh, I mean, uh, honestly, uh, SpaceX's uh, anomaly on September 1st last year, I think, is what raised the most concerns. Like, if SpaceX, you know, can have an accident like that happen during fueling operations, then that you know, could very much put astronauts at risk. So I think that's kind of the main reason why that was uh, brought to a lot of people's attention and, and people voiced concerns over the idea of, having the astronauts board the vehicle and then fuel the rocket. So um, that's what I'm getting from that. I mean, rocketry is extremely risky one way or another. Whether we're fueling it before or after the crew uh, gets on board, I don't, I mean, in my opinion, it's equally as risky, but that's just my opinion. All right, next up, Capcom. This one also comes off of YouTube. Oh, I should have read this one beforehand. (laughs) It was shortened, so I figured, oh, I'm not gonna screw this one up. It's from Earfront. Says, uh, dark Uh-oh. matter is not a thing. Get used to it. Jared? <laughs> oh. Okay, dark matter is a thing. <laughs> Get used to it. <laughs> and in fact, I have like reached a level of I'm not going to put up with this anymore so much that I'm doing a space pod for January about dark matter. So, but we're going to find out whether I'm right or I'm wrong. Either way <laughs> with that. So, um, but yeah, it's. It, it, you can see the effects of it. Does that necessarily mean it's a thing or not? Well, there's, that's, that's the great question. I guess that's the Nobel Prize winning question at that point as to whether it makes it um, an actual type of matter or not. Um, but, you know, that's going to be one of the fun things we're going to find out in the space pod is whether dark matter really is a thing or not. And I'm leaning towards the fact that it is a thing because if dark matter wasn't real, you wouldn't be able to see the influence of it. 
So. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we're gonna have my two cents. We've seen, yeah. Even though we don't know what it is, we have detected it. We know that we've seen that it's there. You know that just because we don't know what it, it is doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Yeah, like we've you observed could, it. You could like weaken strong nuclear forces. You know, they're very small for they're very powerful forces that happen on such small scales that you and I can't see them personally. So are we gonna say that that because of that we can't uh, that there's no such thing as the weak or strong nuclear force? I mean that. That would be just ridiculous to do something like that. So. <laughs> That's cool that you're made of atoms, but I'm not made out of atoms because <laughs> yeah. I don't believe that. My that atoms are not actually. Like, and I can't see mine, bonded, so you know, whatever. So, <laughs> I'm just an aether drifting around um, that just so happens to be unable to go through solid things. So. Hmm. I, I did not know that about you. <laughs> All right, next up, Capcom. Last comment. The last comment comes off of YouTube as well. This is from BPG131313. <laughs> Surprised that none of you mentioned that 2016 was a year you moved into a new studio. It's kind of a big deal. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've been... Uh, no, we haven't been. Um, Dada, Dada, Dada has been w working his fool head off uh, the, uh, the, from the moment that last show in 2016 ended. We're like, thanks everyone, goodbye, see you next year. Dip to black, he hit stop, walked out there and started ripping things apart so he could begin preparing for the, uh, for the set this year, and, or the sets, plural, and I think they are all sorts of incredible. Um, the new, uh, the observation deck uh, that I came up with like moments before I went out there. Yeah, no, we noticed that. That was great. <laughs> yeah. I, do we like that? Is that sticking? Am I keeping that observation yeah, deck? Like all right, that. all right. We can discuss so, all that later. <laughs> we're keeping it. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> that's how that's gonna work. Uh, so the observation deck, I think, looks absolutely incredible. It is 25 feet wide. It's got, um, that planet is not green screen, so we'll be able to do some camera movements. Um, it, it's it's just absolutely incredible. It's not actually done done yet, much to Dutta's dismay. Uh, so we're gonna show you in After Dark some of the parts that go in those windows that are clearly not quite done. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> I'm just going to warn you, After Dark may have some uh, stronger language this particular week. <laughs> because he struggled. Uh, he was up insane crazy hours. He gave up his last two weeks. He was supposed to be on vacation. He didn't get any of it working uh, like you wouldn't believe uh, to get everything done. And uh, I just, from the bottom of my heart and from everyone here, yeah. I want to thank him because uh, we would not be where we're at right now. Uh, even this control room looking like this uh, is, is all thanks to him. Uh, even this desk, let me just tell you the story of this desk. <laughs> before we go, before we go. No, 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 I'm going to tell the story of this desk in the main <laughs> show and then we're going to go into After Dark. This is a very long show, I don't care. Uh, so we went to Ikea to get a desk because this room was supposed to be my problem So we went to get a desk and we were there and we just couldn't find anything couldn't find anything couldn't find anything And we, we came back and we're like dude. We couldn't find anything. It all sucks He's like well, I can build you a shape that coordinates with the windows that we're creating. We're like Okay, so he said you need to go get legs So we went back and we got legs by the time we came back this was done and ready to go, and he was continuing to work on the main set. I was going to say, this was done and literally gathering dust. Yeah, he was like, paint it, attach the legs, your problem now. Yeah. So, <laughs> that, that is the level of awesome that he bring to the show. Uh, so again, huge thank you to Dada yes. and his wife for letting him do this, because it was crazy. Uh, like I said, we're going to show you all this fun stuff in After Dark. Speaking of, After Dark is up next. Uh, and then uh, for everyone else, it'll be available in a few weeks. Thank you so much for joining, and uh, we'll see you next week. See you guys.